So let's speak a little bit about how hard is it to compute a Nash equilibrium in a normal form game. So let's let's start with a little history. Uh, uh, John von Neumann, uh, one of the uh, founders of modern game theory, when uh, he investigated uh, zero-sum game, um, uh, he proved the uh, the existence of equilibrium there, and uh, he used what's known as the uh, Brouwer fixed point theorem for that, um, and that led directly to algorithms for computing uh, fixed points in such uh, in such linear programs. Uh, first, uh, there was Dantig's algorithm that uh, that really equivalent to what in modern days is called LP duality, and it's an exponential uh, procedure, uh, although in practice uh, used widely. Of note is the Hachian uh, uh, polynomial time uh, approach to solving linear programs. Although in truth, uh, in practice, it's it's not used as widely. It's uh, not as practical a procedure. And when you go beyond uh, zero-sum games, uh, so when John Nash approved the existence of equilibrium for more general sum uh, games, he used the same uh, fixed point theorem of Brouwer, and that also informed a, a series of algorithms, um, and uh, they're noted there on the slide. And we will be looking at two of them, the Lem Lemke-Hausen algorithm uh, and a much more uh, recent algorithm due to uh, Ryan Porter and others. I will note that all of these are exponential in the worst case, uh, and I'll get back to that um, later. So let's start with the Lemke-Hausen algorithm, and let's start with a, uh, a formulation of the natural equilibrium uh, uh, for two-player games, uh, it looks it looks as follows, um, and this is a busy slide, but uh, I'll walk you through it, and all will become um, become clear. At heart are two sets of variables, the s's and the r's. The s's will denote the uh, will capture the mixed strategy used by the two players, player one and player two. Uh, s one, for example, of uh, uh, S, S2K, for example, would be the um, weight or the probability with which uh, player two plays action K in, uh, in, in his mixed strategy. So the S1s and the uh, S2s are the uh, uh, capture the mixed strategy of the two players, player one and player two. R's are what are called the slack variables. And to understand their roles, let's look at, for example, this equation right there. So this applies to any uh, action of player one. For any action of player one, we look at the value uh, that it, uh, uh, the, the, the value that it gives with respect to the uh, strategy of the uh, of the other player, and so we look at all the actions available to player two. We look at the payoff to player one, given that he is playing a particular action J, and looking at that uh, 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 action of player uh, uh, player of the other two and normalizing it by the probability that the player two attaches to that strategy, uh, A2. And so if we look at this sum as a whole, this is the, the expected payoff for player one when playing strategy J, given that uh, the player two is playing uh, a certain mixed strategy, S2. And it is what it is. And in general, uh, if you look at all the actions that uh, the uh, player, uh, player one plays, uh, they will give different payoffs. What we want is for player one to best respond to that strategy of player two. 
because in equilibrium, every player is best responding to the other. And so let's call u star one to be the payoff to player two, uh, to player one in the, in the natural equilibrium. So in general, uh, the payoff uh, for player one when they play AJ will be uh, no greater than the best response, but in general will be less. So we're going to add this slack variable, as it's called, that will say this is how much player one is missing relative to their best response when they're playing strategy J. Those are the slack variables. And so now that will also give us a sense for this condition here. So the slack variables are always non-negative. And in a natural equilibrium, they will be exactly zero, except when you speak about strategies that are actually played with zero probability by the player. So now we talk about the S's. S's, as we said, speak about the weight in the mix uh, that each player gives to their uh, each of their actions in the uh, mix strategy they play. And so when player one plays uh, strategy J with non-zero probability, it better be the case that he's better, best responding, namely that the slack variable is zero. And when they're playing with zero probability, you don't care what the slack variable is because uh, they're not playing that strategy at all. And you capture that by requiring that the product be zero. This is exactly the condition, and this is what makes it a linear complementarity uh, problem. So I hope that's clear, and uh, you can see now similarly for uh, player two. For player two, we take each of their actions, and we say, if they're going to play it with, not, with, with some probability, um, uh, then and we look at their best response here, uh, given whatever player one is going to play their mix strategy, and we're going to look at the slack variable here, and again we're going to require that the product be uh, zero. In other words, uh, the probability that they play J is uh, non-zero just in case the slack variable is zero. Okay. So uh, this is uh, the nature of this um, of this um, mathematical optimization pr uh, program, and of course uh, I forgot to mention, but of course we want the pr the S's to be a probability distribution. So they sum to one, and they're all non-zero. All right. So this is our linear complementarity program, and now come Lemke Housen, who suggests to uh, find a solution in a particular way, and uh, we won't go over it, but the flavor of, of it is to initialize the S's and the R's a particular way, in fact, to artificially initialize them all to zero, and then one by one take them, it's called a pivoting procedure, take the an, an S and an R in turn, alternating between the two, taking them out of the set that has the current value, and uh, replacing it with a complementary variable, if it's an R replacing with an S and with an S replacing an R, until you get a, an equilibrium. That's the general flavor of it, and um, in, in this lecture we won't uh, go in more detail into the Lemke-Hausen procedure. But it is a procedure that looks very deeply at what a Nash equilibrium is, sets it up as a mathematical uh, program, and then searches uh, the space of variables uh, in an informed way. Let's now look at a very different procedure, one that doesn't look in as much detail at the structure of equilibria, uh, but um, compensates by, uh, by performing heuristic search in, in, in a certain way. So, um, so let's look at it, and we'll look at it uh, at two stages. The first step is to note that when you fix the support of a strategy profile, finding out whether 
there is a national equilibrium with that support is an easy problem. Remember that the support of a strategy is uh, consists of all the uh, actions to which the player is giving non-zero probability in that mixed strategy. So let's look at this formulation. Let's look, and this will be uh, limited to two players. Uh, and so let's look at all players in turn, for example, player one, and let's look at every action of that player, for example, a sub i. We'll be looking for some mixed strategy P, mixed strategy uh, 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 profile uh, for one for each of the uh, players that will um, uh, give us uh, a, a, a national equilibrium, namely each agent will be responding. And so for all actions in the support that we're considering, we'd want the agent to be best responding. So let's assume that the best response value is V sub i, just call it that number, that we want AI, to, in fact, to be a best response to the rest. And what we want is all other actions, any other actions not in support, to give us a value that's no greater than the best response. And we want it for each, each of the two players and each of their actions in the support. So that makes sense. And we want these to be a uh, probability. So we want the um, probabilities uh, in the support to be non-zero. We want the uh, probabilities outside the support to be zero. And we want it indeed to be a probability distribution. This all makes sense. So this is a linear program. It's solvable in polynomial time. Uh, that is, theoretically, uh, there's a polynomial time procedure. Uh, in practice, the procedures used uh, are not polynomial in the worst case, but, uh, but nonetheless effective. By the way, notice that we actually use the assumption that uh, we're fixing the support here. Superficially, you might look at it and say, oh, I could do the same thing, but uh, simply ignore the support part. Where, where are we using that really? Well, we're using it in the assumption that um, when we're best responding inside and don't have a profit deviation, uh, we're actually playing these PIs with probability, uh, with a positive probability. Because uh, if we playing the remaining strategy with zero probability, in fact, it doesn't matter if we're best responding to it or not. And so this is where this assumption is hidden. So now we know that when we fix the support, uh, we can solve the uh, question efficiently. Uh, the uh, fly in the ointment is the fact that there's an exponential number of supports to explore. And this is the second part. We need to simply now start exploring the uh, the set of support. And I won't go into details about how we do it, but the uh, basic idea is the following. We will bias the support to supports that are um, close in size to one another. Uh, that is, we will not start by considering uh, one agent looking at only two strategies among which he's, ran he's randomizing and the other agent looking at 17 strategies. We'll look at a strategy profile that's uh, similar, uh, whose support is similar in size. We'll also start with small supports uh, and gradually move to larger supports. If we do that and we involve an, and we, we, we use another trick called conditional domination, that is, we look at certain things we can ignore uh, along the way, uh, then what turns out that although the procedure is in the worst case exponential, um, as is the Lemke-Hausen, uh, in fact it performs uh, in practice quite well and uh, in fact uh, better than uh, essentially all other procedures uh, tried, including the, uh, the Lemke-Hausen. These procedures do have exponential worst case, uh, and so the question is, can we do better? Are there uh, procedures that are um, less than exponential in the worst case? And that takes us from the realm of uh, complex uh, al algorithms 
to the realm of complexity analysis. So let's first remind ourselves a little bit about what complexity analysis looks like. We're looking at classes, whole classes of problems, such as the class of all games and the problem of determining uh, a, uh, a sample Nash equilibrium in those games. And we look at the uh, how hard is that class as a whole. And so here are, it's a small part of the complexity hierarchy. The uh, class uh, P, uh, as it's known, is the class of problem for which a polynomial time solution is, is known. The class NP is the class of problems for which a uh, class, uh, a solution can be verified in polynomial time, but uh, not necessarily uh, found in polynomial time. The class NP complete is the hardest among all the NP classes, that is the classes to which all NP problems can be uh, reduced. And perhaps the biggest uh, unsolved problem in theoretical computer science is the question of whether NP is different from P. It's widely believed to be, but uh, has not been proved. So this is the uh, general background we need to keep in mind. And now we can ask, well, where does, uh, where does uh, the problem of finding a natural equilibrium reside? In P, in NP, what can we say? Well, first of all, strictly speaking, we can't quite speak about it being in uh, P or NP because we know from Nash's theorem that a Nash equilibrium always exists. So the question, does it exist in Nash equilibrium, is trivial. The answer is yes. So we need to look at it a little differently. One way to look at it differently is to ask for Nash equilibrium with specific kind of um, uh, properties. So for example, we can say, uh, does it have unique Nash equilibrium? Or does a exist an equilibrium that's strictly Pareto efficient? Or does is there a natural equilibrium that guarantees a given player some minimum payoff? Or can we guarantee some min some minimum social welfare in a natural equilibrium? Does there exist a natural equilibrium that that includes some pure pure strategy, some action of the player in it? or conversely, that does exclude it. All of these and others are examples of questions that are uh, provably uh, NP, uh, NP hard. Okay, so that tells us something about the hardness, but still, um, we still ask about uh, just finding a sample Nash equilibrium. How hard is that? So we've seen the algorithm. People have tried very hard to find algorithms uh, computing a sample Nash equilibrium. Um, and it does seem hard. The question is, can we somehow uh, capture that formally within uh, the complexity hierarchy? And, um, and, um, and for that, we need to introduce some new, new, uh, new concepts. Uh, the essential concept is that of the new class of problems called PPAD for polynomial parity arguments uh, on directed graphs introduced uh, by Christos Papadimitri in 1994. Uh, we won't go into detail, but just so you know the chronology, uh, PPAD is a specialization of a class called TFNP, which is in turn was a specialization of a problem called FNP. Uh, going in detail here is, is, is beyond the scope of, of uh, what uh, we want to speak about, but uh, it does help us now position uh, uh, the complexity of finding a sample Nash equilibrium in the complexity hierarchy. And again, we have uh, the class of polynomial time uh, problems, of problems that can be verified in polynomial time, with these being the hardest among them, and given that, PPAD turns out to reside somewhere within this class. Now, again, we don't know whether this uh, entire class does not collapse and all become one and the same. It's widely believed that it does not, but uh, proof doesn't exist. 
However, uh, we do know that PPAD lies someplace in between P and NP. Now, what does that have to do with uh, the problem of computing a natural equilibrium? Well, that's where the, the following theorems come in. Uh, originally, it was shown that the problem of computing a natural equilibrium is complete for this class PPAD. That is, it's the hardest among all problems in that class. Initially proved for four players, then for th all for games with three or more players, and then finally in 06 for all, all, all class of games. And so we uh, widely believe that the problem is not polynomial, cannot prove it, but we do know where it resides within the complexity hierarchy that we are familiar with.